pleasure to be before you once again today. We have in Acts chapter 17 a, a great sermon that Paul delivers. I'd like to spend a few moments with you going through that and then, as always, considering a few thoughts from his, that is, God's word. In Acts 17, verse 22, it says there, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing that he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and hath the bounds of their habitation. That they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live, and move, and have our being, as certainly also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is likened to gold, or silver, or stone, graven by art and man's device. And this is the next two verses I'd like for us to kind of zero in on this afternoon. Verse 30, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness, by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he raised him from the dead. As we said, and as was mentioned this morning in Bible class, this was a great opportunity that Paul took to teach the gospel to these people. And he took an idol, of all things, to start his sermon. Which tells me there's so many opportunities that I think we're not taking simply because we're not looking for them. He took a great opportunity here to give them this lesson. But he goes through this list of, of notes, if you will. And in verse 30 he said, And the times of this ignorance God winked at. That word winked is basically overlooked. It, it, it's the idea of withholding punishment. God didn't ignore it. These people would be accounted for it, account, have to show accountability for their actions. But by and large, he didn't call to end the physical realm because of this ignorance exhibited by mankind. I think we see this with children best of all. And it's, it's shown very well in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. Paul there says, When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Well, this is obviously true of the individual. Think back to when you were young, however long or short time ago that was, and think about all the different things that you did that maybe you regret, and why in the world would I ever do such a thing? Things that aren't necessarily wrong in and of themselves. I know when I was one or two years old, I took a, a screwdriver and shoved it to an outlet. And... Uh, Evidently, as I don't remember it, evidently I walked into the room next time and I pointed at that outlet. I said, hot. 
I made a lesson there. I learned something. But as a child, I did foolish things. Unfortunately, some adults still do foolish things. But we expect this out of children. We expect them to do foolish things. But as a race, mankind has done quite a bit of foolish things. And we see here that God winked at those times. You, you, you look at the Old Testament, and you see God bearing with mankind. You look at the law of Moses and all the dietary restrictions. I couldn't be a Jew because I love bacon so much. But why were those certain restrictions ever put into place? Well, there's several reasons, but one reason would be to compensate for the fact of scientific knowledge of germs. How long ago did we learn about germs? Certainly wasn't 5,000 years ago. Even though we would still be stricken with the consequences of germs, but there's certain ways that we have to prepare food to kill certain germs that would be in food, and especially as pigs. You think of what they eat, it's disgusting. They even eat themselves sometimes. You've got to keep the, the boars from the piglings, otherwise he'll eat up all the bacon seeds. But see, mankind didn't know all that. And there's so many other things we could go on with with that, but God bore along with mankind. And as man progressed as a race, he was able to learn new things and be able to handle different advancements in technology, different forms of knowledge and wisdom. So this was a time period of, of God winking at this ignorance. I mean, you look at, at Genesis chapter 6. He destroyed the world because of sin. Why didn't He call everything to an end at that point? It falls under verse 30 here. Now, there's, I think there's several reasons for the flood, specifically a type of baptism, but God allowed for mankind to develop as a race. But all of that in mind, I, I kind of look at the Old Testament as somewhat of a funnel. And as God deals with mankind, it becomes less and less direct involvement and more reliance upon a written word. And that funnel coming eventually down to Acts chapter 2. Jesus dying on the cross, the church being established. And now there's so much more demanded of mankind without the direct involvement of God. Because we have the written word. We have those events uh, recorded for us in past time and space, in history. But you see... All that ignorance that man committed and all the things he did in that ignorance, God winked at. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Who does that leave out? It leaves no one out. Every person in existence from the time this statement was made originally to the end of time physical, our life in the flesh, generations to come, God expects all men everywhere to repent of their sins. Not only would this defeat the idea that only the Christians are amenable to the law of Christ, but this shows God's care for all men. It shows His love for all men. If He didn't want all men to be saved, no such commandment would ever be made. But it is. And it's something we're expected to do. Repent of our sins. And then verse 31. Why? Because there will indeed be a day when he does call his physical realm to an end. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Well, who is that man? None other than Jesus the Christ. John chapter 14 verse 6. Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. What assurance do we have? Well, it's because Jesus was resurrected. Not only did death, death not have any power over Christ, because he had done no sin, it set a pattern for us. It, set, it gave us hope 
when we're faithful to God, we have a resurrection to look forward to, and that is ultimately heaven. When this final day does come, we'll be given a glorified body, a body fitted for heaven rather than a body fitted for the torments of hell. But that's the assurance we're given. If God was able to raise Jesus Christ from the dead, He is able to raise us from the dead. Are we ready for this day? 2 Peter chapter 2, or uh, chapter 3, verse, chapter 3 rather, verses 9 through 13, point to this end of time. Verse 9 there, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward. That's the idea of God winking at sin. He pushed off punishment. He's long-suffering. He's dealing with man and his ignorance, knowing that as he develops, as a race, he will come to better knowledge. He will put away foolish things. But God is long-suffering toward us, or usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the element shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of the Lord, wherein the heavens being on fire and shall be dissolved, and the element shall melt with a fervent heat. Obviously there are the heavens representing the, the atmosphere, space, outer space, heavens and the earth. And thir verse 13, Nevertheless we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. What a place to be. It's going to be a new heaven and a new earth to us. We won't have to deal with all the wickedness that we see around us every single day. You think of Lot. He's described as being just. He was vexed by the wickedness of those people that he had to live with. There will be none of that. Wherein dwelleth righteousness. Now this afternoon... If you're not a Christian, when this day comes, you stand unprepared. When the elements do melt with a fervent heat, that's just a foreshadowing of what's going to happen to you and all those others who are wicked. I think of, if you want incentive outside of the Bible, you think of all the wicked people of, of history. You think of all the murderers throughout history that we always despise in history in history talks, or you know, such and such did a horrible thing of you know, like Hitler and Mao and and Stalin. We were moved by those people for several decades, and we rightly so condemn their actions. If you die lost, guess where you're going to be with those people. I think of my father. He's not what he's supposed to be. Hasn't been for a while. If I die lost, I have to spend eternity with him. That's not something I wanted to do when I was 20 years old. Why would I want to do it forever? And I'm sure we all have somebody that fits that category. Now obviously we want better for these people. We want them to repent. Just as God does, commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Some people will not do that. Some people will not obey the gospel of their Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. But if this is appealing to you, that is rendering obedience to God, becoming a Christian, becoming His child, washed clean of your sins, we have that opportunity in a few moments. Obey the gospel. Put on Christ in baptism. 
Yet if you already are a child of God, yet you've allowed sin to return to your life, to whatever capacity that might be, why not put that sin away? Confess your sins. We'll pray with you and pray for you. If you have either of these needs, make it known as together we stand and sing.